In this lesson, we're going to go over the traditional elements of the intentional tort of trespass to land. Here we say the intentional tort of trespass to land occurs when the defendant causes or is a substantial factor in bringing about a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land with specific or general intent. So, if we take a step back for a second and we think again about the big picture and we think back to our first lesson on intentional torts when we talked about the prima facie case, the essential elements of almost all intentional torts. Remember, we said the essential elements of almost all intentional torts are number one, the voluntary act requirement by the defendant, number two, the intent requirement, and number three, the causation requirement. And as we worked through all of our intentional torts that we've gone through to this point, battery, assault, false imprisonment, intentional infliction of emotional distress, we saw in all of those intentional torts, we had different variations of these three essential elements, a voluntary act requirement by the defendant, the intent requirement, and the causation requirement. Well, even though we're moving from basically the intentional torts that involve harms to people, things like battery and assault and false imprisonment, intentional infliction of emotional distress, we're moving away from these intentional torts that deal with harms to the person, to human beings, and we're moving to intentional torts that deal with harms to property, things like trespass to land and trespass to chattels. Even though we're moving from these harms to the people to harms to property, the essential elements of the intentional torts themselves really don't change. Those three prima facie essential elements we've been talking about of the voluntary act requirement by the defendant, the intent requirement, and the causation requirement relatively stay the same. And we see them baked into our elements here with trespass to land. We start with our causation requirement, then we get into our voluntary act requirement by the defendant, and then we get into our third element, which is going to be the intent requirement. And actually, our causation requirement and our intent requirement are very similar to the analyses we already went over with battery, assault, and false imprisonment. You remember with intentional infliction of emotional distress, the intent requirement was a little bit different. We had that recklessness idea tossed in with the intentional infliction of emotional distress. But otherwise, when we're thinking about battery, assault, and false imprisonment, right, this specific intent, general intent requirement with trespass to land operates very similarly. Same with our causation requirement. So again, big picture, the prima facie case, the essential elements are largely staying the same. Even though we're moving from harms to people to harms to property, our essential elements kind of stay the same. Okay, so this is pretty good news. This should make this a little bit more straightforward because we already have a good idea how this first element and this third element work. So the main focus for us will really be this second element. Okay, but of course we'll explain how intent works with trespass to land. This is something we wanna be aware of. This can be tricky. So we'll really go over this third element in a lot of detail too, but we can just break it down element by element starting with our causation requirement first. Again, the intentional tort of trespass to land occurs when the defendant causes or is a substantial factor in bringing about a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land. With all of our other intentional torts and the same with trespass to land, we have to make sure that the defendant is the legal cause of the harm sustained by the plaintiff. Here, what the harm we're dealing with is really a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land. So we have to make sure that our defendant is the legal cause of the physical invasion of the plaintiff's land. And for our purposes in intentional torts, that just means the defendant has to be a substantial factor in bringing about the physical invasion. Again, remember, there can always be multiple factors contributing to the plaintiff's harm, whatever the harm is. And the harm's a little bit different with each intentional tort, from battery, assault, false imprisonment, intentional infliction of emotional distress. Our harm changes a little bit, but the rule, the operation, the mechanics of it are similar, right? We just have to make sure that whatever the harm is, 
the defendant is a substantial factor in bringing about that harm. So if there's multiple factors, as long as the defendant is a substantial factor, that's enough to satisfy our causation requirement for all of the intentional torts we're going over. This is the same with trespass to land. As long as the defendant is a substantial factor in bringing about the physical invasion, our causation element will be satisfied. And for trespass to land, causation is usually going to be pretty straightforward, right? We're usually not going to have major issues here. Think about it. If somebody's walking onto somebody else's land, there is no causation issue there. The defendant is clearly going to be the legal cause of the invasion when he's walking on someone else's land, right? And that's oftentimes what we're seeing. Somebody else is actually entering another person's land. That's like your garden variety trespass to land. Oftentimes in our kind of classic fact patterns, causation is usually not a big issue. The heart of the analysis usually comes down to defining what a physical invasion is and understanding intent. So let's break these down in a lot of detail, okay? So starting with our second element, the voluntary act requirement, which is this idea of physical invasion. What do we mean here? So again, we say to hold the defendant liable or the intentional tort of trespass to land occurs when the defendant causes or is a substantial factor in bringing about a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land. So we need to understand what this concept of physical invasion means. And the best place to start with when we're trying to understand what a physical invasion is, is the interest that's being protected when we're thinking about trespass to land. In trespass, we say the interest protected is the land possessor's right of exclusive possession of land and its physical condition. This comes from the second restatement of torts. The interest protected when we're dealing with trespass to land is the land possessor's right of exclusive possession of land and its physical condition. So it's important to recognize when you go and you purchase land, you get the deed to land, either you're gifted land or you go buy land, you get the deed to some piece of land. What are you really getting, right? When you become the owner, the proud owner of some dirt on the ground, some land, right? What are you actually getting when you, you know, purchase land or someone grants you a piece of land? your gifted land, however you get the land, when you become the lawful owner of a piece of land, what are you actually getting? Say you go and you buy a house, right? Let's draw up a house. Say you go and you buy a house. What are you actually purchasing? Of course you're purchasing like the materials of the house, you know, but are you really purchasing kind of the dirt itself and the, the materials of the house? That might be kind of part of it, but all of that stuff you can like get rid of, right? I mean, you can tear the house down, you can clear the dirt out. I mean, what are you really at the core of purchasing that home? What are you really buying? Well, what you're really purchasing are these bundle of rights that we associate with ownership of property. Because even the concept of ownership of land is kind of complicated, right? It's a legal fiction. Ownership of land is a concept we as society and humans have kind of just invented and adopted, right? The idea that you can exercise so much dominion and control over a natural bounty, right? Dirt on the earth, that you can have so much control over that, that it's yours, you own it, right? This is a legal fiction that we've just kind of created and adopted and accepted as a society. So with this though idea of a legal fiction, that means when you're buying property, when you're buying land, you're really buying a bundle of rights. And we talk about this a lot in real property, all of these bundle of rights, we want to understand the bundle of rights. But one of the rights that you're buying is this idea of exclusive possession of land and its physical condition. Okay, and this is what trespass to land is protecting. You know, you've got all of these rights. The one that trespass to land is protecting is the right of exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition, which basically means when you become a lawful owner of land or a lawful possessor of land, 
you get to decide who comes and goes on your property. This is a right that you enjoy, right? When you own something, when you're the possessor of that land or you're the owner of that land, you generally get to decide, you know, there could be co-owners and things like that, of course, but assume you're the sole owner of a piece of land, right? You're the sole owner. You get to decide then who comes and goes on that land. You have the right of exclusive possession of the land. So you can say, Bobby, you get to come. Amy, you don't get to come on my land. You get to make those calls. You purchased it. When you became the lawful possessor or owner of that land, you got the right of exclusive possession. That's one of your bundle of rights. With that, you also kind of get this concept of not only do you get exclusive possession of the land, you also get the right of exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition. You get to kind of determine what the physical condition of that land will be. That's your right as having exclusive possession. You get to determine the physical condition of that land. So if you wanna put a tree in your front yard, and of course there could be things like zoning ordinances and stuff like that. So you can't do anything you want, as long as it's within the rules of whatever the zoning ordinances are that might exist in the area that your land is in. But assuming you're doing everything lawfully, right? you can decide to have a tree in your front yard if you want, you can have some bushes, you know, you can put some flowers in your front yard. You can decorate the interior of your home however you want. You can organize rocks in your front yard if you want some rocks in your front yard. If you want to remove the rocks, you can remove the rocks. You have exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition. You get to decide who comes on the land, who goes on the land, and generally what the physical condition of the land is going to be. Whether there's going to be rocks on the ground or no rocks on the ground. That's your call because you are the possessor, the lawful owner of that land. That's a right that you have. That's a right that you enjoy. Okay, so thus, any tangible thing that enters the land constitutes a physical invasion because any tangible thing and for our purposes the traditional definition of a tangible thing is basically any people or visible matter when we think about visible matter for now let's accept that visible matter is visible solids and liquids things like a rock is a visible solid, right? You can see a rock and hold it in your hand. It's visible, it's solid, we understand that. Same thing with like water. Water is visible liquid. You can hold it kind of, and you can cup it and hold it in your hands, okay? So that's what we're thinking about when we're thinking about tangible things. The traditional, the traditional understanding of tangible things are basically people in anything that's visible that you can kind of hold in your hand, solids and liquids, right? That's what we're typically thinking of tangible things. So if a tangible thing enters the land, that's basically going to be unlawfully, that's basically going to be a violation of this interest, the land possessor's right of exclusive possession of the land in its physical condition. Right, start with people as a tangible thing. If a person comes on your land, say you've just purchased this home, you're the sole owner of the home, and some guy walks on your land without your permission, say he doesn't have any privilege to be on the land, he has no lawful right of access to the land, and he walks on your land, what's he just done? He's just violated your right of exclusive possession of the land. You get to decide who comes and goes. You purchased that right. And that's the right that trespass the land is protecting. So that's where we would say, okay, that is a physical invasion of your land. When someone walks on it, right, they're violating your right of exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition. Therefore, and because it's a tangible thing, it's really easy to see. It's a person walking on. We can easily see how that's a violation of your right of exclusive possession. You get to decide who comes and goes. This guy can't walk on your land without your permission or any other privilege to do so. You purchased that right when you bought the home. Okay, so any tangible thing that enters the land constitutes a physical invasion. So what if that guy walking by your land doesn't actually enter it himself, but he chucks a rock on the land? 
Is that a physical invasion? Well, think about the interest being protected. Remember, we said you get to decide where the rocks on your land go. If you want to move a rock from point A to point B, you can go out in your front yard and do this all day long. You purchased the right to make that decision. You have exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition. You get to decide where the rocks go. So if some dude walks by and chucks a rock on your land, well, he's just violated your right, hasn't he? He's violated your right of exclusive possession of land and its physical condition. Right? He doesn't have any lawful right of entry or he doesn't have your consent to throw the rock on your land. He doesn't have some privilege to throw the rock on your land. You know, he's just doing it. And that's a violation of your right of exclusive possession of the land in its physical condition. Because you get to decide as the exclusive owner, as the sole owner, and you are the one who has this right of exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition, you get to decide where those rocks go, not this guy. So that would be a physical invasion. That's a tangible thing. It's something you can hold in your hands. It's a visible piece of matter. It's a solid. It's a visible piece of matter you can hold in your hands. So we have the tangible thing that's entering the land. It's clearly violating the exclusive, the land possessor's right of exclusive possession of land in its physical condition. Okay, so throwing a rock on the land, very easy to see how that's a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land. So one starting point to recognize is a trespass to land does not have to be a person actually entering someone else's land without their permission. It's any tangible thing that enters the land. So if a person throws a rock, if a person floods the land with water, any of this in any jurisdiction will be a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land. Okay, so that's our starting point with all this, understanding the interest being protected and this concept of the tangible thing to try to get a starting point of what a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land is. So this would be the rule basically in any court. In any court, if we have a person walking onto someone else's land or we have a person throwing a thing, a tangible thing onto a person's land, that's a physical invasion. So let's think about one other thing before we add some nuance to this. Say that a person walks onto your land for one second. Say you own the home, you've bought this home, you're the sole possessor of that home, you're the sole owner and possessor of the home. And say some guy kind of walks onto your land, he stands there for one second, and then he walks off your land. Okay, and say it is a trespass. Say all the elements are satisfied. Here our defendant has caused a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land and say he had the specific intent to do so, right? He wants to come onto your land. He satisfies the intent requirement, right? He's got the desire that his actions will cause a physical invasion. He satisfies intent. So all three elements are satisfied and say there's no defenses. He doesn't have consent to be on the land. There's no pr privilege that could apply. Right? The three elements are satisfied, there's no defense. What is the plaintiff suing for? This guy steps on the land for one second and he walks away. What damage has the plaintiff actually sustained here that the plaintiff is suing for? Kind of weird, right? We have all of our elements satisfied, but the plaintiff hasn't sustained any actual damages. There's no like, actual compensable damages here. So what would the plaintiff be suing for? In that case, with a fact pattern like that, the plaintiff might be suing for nominal damages, right? The plaintiff in a traditional trespass to land analysis, in a traditional trespass to land case, the plaintiff doesn't necessarily have to sue for actual damages. The plaintiff can sue for trespass to land basically just to enforce his right of exclusive possession of the land in its physical condition. It's not that he has compensatable injuries, actual damages he needs to be compensated for. He just is basically wanting to enforce his right of exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition. So he might seek $1 in court basically just to commemorate his vindication in open court that this is a violation of his right of exclusive possession. 
Okay, so he can do that. That's allowed. Trespass to land, it's generally accepted principle of law. The traditional approach is a plaintiff is within his rights to sue for $1 in nominal damages for a trespass to land scenario like we just described, where a person steps on the land for one second, he's committed his trespass, and he leaves. Even though there's no actual damages, the plaintiff can still sue, okay? That's just one other kind of thing we need to understand about trespass to land before we move on. Okay, with all of this understood as basically what the traditional definition is of a physical invasion of the plaintiff's land, we can add some nuance where this gets a little more complicated, <laughs> okay? But everything we've talked about is the traditional approach and would pretty much hold true in a majority of jurisdictions today, right? That is the traditional kind of baseline starting point. So where this gets interesting is basically one of the most famous cases we have on this, a seminal case, is going to be Martin V. Reynolds Metal Company. So imagine the following scenario. This is, uh, this is a real case, Martin V. Reynolds Metal Company. In this case, Martin owns a piece of land, our plaintiffs, Martin, owns a piece of land, and he's got some cattle on this land. He has some livestock on the land. And down the road, there's a metal reduction company. Basically, they're smelting aluminum, right, to reduce down this aluminum. And as they smelt this aluminum, this company, this metal company down the road, as they smelt this aluminum, what happens is these invisible particles kind of float up into the sky, right? They're not visible, at least to the naked eye. These invisible particles kind of emanate into the sky and then they come and they settle on the plaintiff's land, the Martin's land. And of course, this kind of contaminates the livestock's eating supply and drinking supply. Their food and water sources get contaminated by these invisible particles that have settled down on the land. And the cattle are poisoned and this costs the Martins you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So ultimately, the Martins realize this, that their cattle, that their livestock has been poisoned by this metal company's you know, particles that emanated across and settled on their land. So they want to sue the metal company for the intentional tort of trespass to land. And of course, the defendants argue, whoa, 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 this is not a trespass to land because there's no tangible thing entering the land. These particles you're talking about are not visible to the naked eye. You know, this isn't a tangible thing. This isn't a person entering your land. This isn't visible matter. This isn't like throwing a rock on your land. This isn't like, you know, flooding your land with some liquid, with some visible piece of matter. We're talking about something invisible, kind of settling down, something that's not visible to the human eye. So how is that a physical invasion, right? Where we don't have this tangible thing entering the land. And here, the Martin court basically says, okay, well, in this case, those particles that are floating over, even though they're not visible to the naked eye, even though they can't be seen, we understand scientifically at an atomic level that these particles are made up of physical components. Basically, all matter on Earth has to be made up of, at an atomic level, some sort of physical component. Whether or not you can see it with the naked eye shouldn't really be important, is basically what the Martin Court is saying. They even cite, they cite Einstein's E equals MC squared. It kind of makes this opinion famous because it's rare that you get scientific equations really cited by a court, especially in an intentional tort case. So this kind of approach though, this more scientific approach, really broadens quite a bit what a physical invasion could be. And so some courts agree with the Martin court 
and they say, yeah, this makes sense. At an atomic level, basically everything is physical. It's made up of those particles that settled. Even though you can't see them with your eyes, your naked eye, right? You can get them under a microscope and you can measure them. They do exist. They are physical. So it is a physical invasion. Some courts agree with this approach. Some courts disagree. And some courts say, no, we want to keep it the traditional approach that a physical invasion really has to be a tangible thing. You have to be able to see it and feel it, right? In order for it to really be a physical invasion. It has to be tangible. So some courts kind of stick with this traditional approach of what a physical invasion is and they still require there be a tangible thing that enters the land. But some courts go in this Martin direction. Now, if you're a court and you're going in this Martin direction, you kind of have one problem though, a potential problem. Think about it. Remember how we said a plaintiff could sue for nominal damages, could sue the defendant for nominal damages for $1. So where they haven't sustained any actual damages, they're not being compensated for any injury. They're not suing for actual damages. They're just suing basically to enforce their rights. Well, if we allow that and we also allow a trespass to occur or a physical invasion to occur where an invisible particle is basically settling or entering the land, this could potentially open up a floodgate of litigation. Anytime a person smells something they don't like on their land, they could basically try to sue their neighbor for nominal damages. Hey, I don't have any actual damages here, but I smelled something I didn't like. That means at some point something physical had to come down onto my property, something physical. If I smelt it, we know at an atomic level, it's got to be physical. So that's a physical invasion, right? So even though I don't have any actual damages here, I'm still going to sue. So there was this fear perhaps that, okay, well, if we allow these two things, basically a plaintiff to sue when they don't have actual damages, for something invisible coming onto their land, it could be potentially just floodgates of litigation. So the courts that go in the Martin Court's direction, where this idea of a physical invasion is interpreted more broadly to include really anything that at an atomic level is physical, which is basically like everything, if you're going in that direction, those courts typically are going to add the requirement that the plaintiff sustain actual compensable damages, like was the case in Martin, where Martin can say, hey, look, my cattle were actually poisoned and it killed this many of my cattle and I have now this many damages because of that. That's actual damages. So courts that go in that direction, it's important to recognize are typically going to also add the requirement that the plaintiff sustain actual damages. Typically, a plaintiff is not going to be able to sue for nominal damages when the invasion of the land is invisible to the naked eye. The fear being it could be floodgates of litigation. Of course, if the invasion is tangible, it's well established, it's a rock being thrown, it's something you can see, then the plaintiff could sue for nominal damages, could sue basically just to enforce the violation of their right of exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition. Okay, with all of this, <laughs> there's one other point we have to address. If we understand kind of all of these concepts, we're ready to kind of think about a trespass to land and distinguish it or try to distinguish it from a private nuisance. When we get further along into torts, we're going to discuss the tort cause of action called private nuisance, okay? And it's going to be important that we're able to distinguish a trespass to land from a private nuisance. So again, the best place to start is with the interest being protected. So we know with trespass, the interest protected is the land possessor's right of exclusive possession of the land and its physical condition. 
Okay, well, what's another relevant right that a land possessor gets when they become the lawful possessor of a piece of land? What's another right that the possessor of that land enjoys? Well, we have this right that we refer to as the land possessor's right of use and enjoyment. We get this idea of use, we can write this up, use and enjoyment. And this is a really important right. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata videos. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else. Um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudicata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're gonna do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Sudicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career, and I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.